Good evening. Thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, joining us for our online midweek Bible study. We are glad uh, that you can uh, access this and, and we hope and pray that it is an encouragement to you that it strengthens your uh, your walk with Jesus and, and deepens your faith. Uh, and so, man, we are just glad you're here. We're glad that you have taken the time out of your schedule um, to, to just join us and, and be a part of what God's doing Uh through Nippingham Baptist Church here this evening. And so, um, again, uh, man, it is it is kind of still setting in that this is kind of the new normal for me. And uh, I know we're, we're, uh, the more I, places I'm able to go and, and uh, even just driving to and from work, you, you see uh, how people have, have kind of settled into this. And and it looks like it's going to be this way for a while. And, and I still, I still, even after last week's study, my, my thing that I miss tremendously is the joining together of the saints on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday morning for coffee, uh, to discuss the word of God, to, to just share and fellowship together. I miss that tremendously as a pastor, as a Christian. Um, and, and I hope and pray that we can get back to normal as soon as possible. Uh, but I was also thinking, what a, what a great opportunity that um, we find ourselves in as Christians um, today in, in our world. There are ways that we can we can still reach out and help serve our neighbors. We can um, we can very easily uh, share encouragement or or even give a gospel presentation by simply sharing a video like this with a, a friend or loved one and. And, and not only that, there's, there's so many needs that are arising now as a result of COVID-19 that, that I think the church is poised and ready to, to meet, um, whether that's helping somebody get groceries or, or giving groceries to people in need or, or donating to a local food bank or the, the opportunities are endless as we find uh, ourselves. And, and in the midst of this, and I, I believe that that in in the past God has used the church, used His His body, the the bride of Christ, to to reach out and and see the needs and meet the needs of so many hurting souls. And as a result, the gospel is proclaimed, the goodness and grace of God is exalted, and people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And, and I hope and pray that that is the case as we continue to move forward uh, with our lockdown scenarios and uh, where shelter in place orders and where wherever we find ourselves, that we will continue to be encouraged by the working and movement of God in and throughout our culture and our communities. And so um, here we go. Acts chapter three this week. And uh, as, as we, as you guys remember from last week, we finished out Acts chapter two. And we know that Peter had preached an amazing sermon where he laid out the gospel clearly that, that we have sin problem, but Christ is the solution to our sin problem. So we need to repent and be baptized. And, um, and after that, it says that the, the people were cut to the heart. It, it got to the, to the very innermost part of who they were as people. And as a result, um, as a result, God, God moved in such a way that 3,000 people what we would consider a revival in Jerusalem at the time, um, gave their lives to Jesus and the church was born. And what's, what's kind of neat about that is, is it was like they, they kind of huddled around. They kind of just stayed there and kind of said, okay, well, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And so all those people who had trusted Christ remained in Jerusalem seeking what to do next. And uh, as I shared last week, it was it was a powerful powerful uh testimony that the church had as they uh as they gathered together and did what god wanted them to do first they they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching now i think sometimes uh, as christians we can all be guilty of half-heartedly approaching the word of god we can open our bibles and we can say well i put in my time or i read my two verses and and i feel better about my life today um and I'm not going to say, hey, if that's what, if you're reading the Word of God and you're getting the Word of God, keep doing it. But I think there comes a point in our lives as Christians where we need to say, you know what? I'm not just going to read a couple verses. I'm going to I'm going to seek to know and understand, and and I'm going to commit myself 
to not only learning what the scriptures say, but applying them and putting them into practice in my life. And so as the disciples or the apostles now would teach, it says these people would listen and they would devote themselves to the teaching. They would be committed to it. They would not only just listen and hear, but they would go for it full bore. They devoted themselves also to fellowship. They, they made uh, gathering together and being together as Christians a, a fundamental part of their day-to-day -day life. They went and they said, you know what? We're going to devote ourselves to fellowship, to having community together, to being a part of each other's lives. And, and that's what I think is throughout history made the, the church so attractive to people sometimes. Because even though they don't understand it, even though they don't necessarily believe it, they can look at a community of believers and say, you know what? Those people love each other. Those people will sacrifice for each other. Those people will help each other out. Those people will do what the rest of the world is not willing to do in their cutthroat mentality of, of climbing the ladder and getting to the top, getting ahead. They look at the church and they say, wow, that's, that's not the way those people live. They live in community. They love each other. They share each other's burdens. They help one another out. But it also says in the scripture, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread together. They were, every time they got together, they were, they were getting together to specifically remember what it is that Christ had done for them. You see, communion, or what we know, what we call the breaking of bread together is a celebration that Christians are commanded to do in the scriptures. Jesus gave us the command um, to do this in remembrance of me whenever you do it. Paul gave the command in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to the church to, to do it properly and, and to do it in, in a sense of remembrance of what it is that Christ had done for us. And this is key for our lives with Jesus. Key, because every day we need to remind ourselves and be reminded of the fact that we are sinners deserving of condemnation, but by the grace of God, Christ came and he died on the cross for us so that we, should we choose to believe that, should we choose to look to the cross and say, there is no other way by which, by which I can be saved, and we give our lives to Jesus, and we need to remember that, that is, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are saved, and, and we need to just praise Jesus as a result. And they committed themselves together to pray. I think one of the saddest states of our church today and the, 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 the corporate church as a whole is the, the, the lack of corporate prayer. Um, when I tell people at our church we still have a midweek Bible study and prayer, sometimes that's kind of shocking to people. You still have a prayer meeting on, on a Wednesday night? And, and it's not something that as a pastor I'm willing to, to get rid of. It's not something that I'm willing to cut maybe because we may have low attendance. The reality is, is that these believers committed themselves to the work, to, to the work of prayer together corporately. And you know what happened? God moved in their midst. God answered their prayers. And it says uh, everybody was, everybody was selling what they had. You see, as they prayed together, as they devoted themselves to fellowship and, and breaking bread together and the, and the teaching of the word of God, God moved. And, and, and we see that in the way that they, they were willing to sell all that they had. It said in verse 45, they were selling their possessions and, and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all who had need. And it says, and day by day, they would attend temple together. That is, they would go to the temple. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, they received their food with generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all people. You see, as they, as they did these things, God moved in such a way that, that, and, and helped them to live in such a way that they had favor with all men. Nobody could say anything bad against these people calling themselves Christians. And it says, and the Lord added to their number daily because of their choice to be obedient to the scriptures, because of their devotion to each other and to the, the, the application and teaching of the word of God, they, were, they the, God moved in a powerful way through them to the point where people trusted Christ as a result of their life and their faith in Jesus. And so our testimony and the way we live in communion together uh, really can have a powerful impact on our communities and our, and our neighbors and our families. And, and I think we need to be sometimes less individualistic, less, um, less busy about what we think is important and really saying, you know what, how, how do we live together? How do we, how do we share life together in such a way that not only are we encouraging one another, but we're also reaching out to our community with the gospel. So that's what we looked at last week. Now, this, this evening, we're going we're gonna to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Um, and don't worry, we won't be here all night. Uh, I, I've hopefully condensed it to about six and a half hours. 
Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Please don't shut off the video at this point. But um, when we look at, um, at Acts chapter 3, we're going to talk about miracles. But before we get into this, let's go ahead and, and pray together, and then we will we'll dive into our text for the evening. God, thank you for your love and your grace this evening. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to be together. Uh, even though it's online, even though it's digitally, uh, God, I pray that you will help us to uh, gain some understanding from your word. God, and not only understanding, but application, Lord, that we can look to you. We can see you at work in our lives, and we could just be walking in, in faithful obedience to what it is you have commanded us to, even from this passage tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so when it comes to miracles, I mean, let, let's be honest here for just a second. When we look at miracles, Sometimes we, we see them in the scripture, we read about them in the gospels or even in the book of Acts or, or other places in scripture and, and, we, and we go, wow, that is, that is cool. That is awesome. Man, and we, sometimes we say, man, how cool would it be to, to see the blind receive sight or, or the crippled and lame uh, rise up and walk yet again and, or to see you know, um, people getting raised from the dead. That would be awesome. And sometimes I think to, to ourselves, maybe if, if we could see a miracle, if we could see the blind receive their sight, man, my faith would be so much stronger. If, if we could see those, those crippled people uh, being healed or the lepers being cleansed, then, then I would be able to be a much more effective evangelist or witness for Christ. Or, or, or you know what, I, I could just, I think, be a little bit more confident going forward. And, and I, I, I asked myself as I thought about those things, would that really be the case? If we had been privileged enough to see the, the miracles of Jesus, would, would our faith have been that much stronger, our walk that much more bold, our witness that much more courageous? Would we be more committed to the gospel if we had seen miracles or we see them regularly? You see, the reason I say that is because if you look at the 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 state of the, the, the Jews during this time. Sure, maybe some saw and they believed and they had a, a great walk, but, but Charles Spurgeon said this, the gospel which they so greatly needed, they would not have. The miracles that Jesus did not always give, they so eagerly demanded. You see, the people had seen Jesus, they had walked with Jesus, they had beheld the miracles, they had uh, experienced those things, they had, uh, to the point where when Jesus came places, he, people would gather in crowds and droves to see the miracles. In fact, even when Jesus is delivered over to Herod at the end of, uh, towards the end of his life before the crucifixion, it said Herod had waited for an audience because he wanted to see some miracle that Jesus would do. You see, the thing is, when we think about miracles, they are amazing. They are the impossible being possible by the grace and mercy of God. And, and we think about those things, and what happens is, is they can almost become somewhat of a spectacle. I don't want to negate miracles. I don't think I want to dissuade you from praying for miracles to happen. I don't want to talk about anything because I still believe that God is the God of the impossible that he can still heal whoever he wants. He can still do whatever he wants. And the things that are impossible for us are still very possible with God. You see, Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You see, what the nation of Israel didn't realize is that, yes, the miracles were amazing. Yes, they were by the power and hand of God. But at the end of the day, they were to validate the authority and messiahship of Jesus Christ. You see, and what happens is they were, they were, they would happen, they'd be done. They would happen, they'd be done. They would happen, they'd be done. You see, and the challenge becomes... Do we trust God because he's God? Or do we trust God simply because we think he can do something for us? You see, John wrote in John chapter 20, verses 26 to 29. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I don't know about you, that freaked me out. Doors are locked. All of a sudden, there's a dude in my house. And Jesus says, peace be with you. Then Thomas said, 
He said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your, out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, Jesus, Jesus told Thomas, look, you see me. You felt me. You've seen the, the holes where I was crucified, uh, where the nails were driven through. You see the, you can see where they pierced my side. You, you believe because you've seen, but how blessed are those who believe because they haven't seen, but because they trust Jesus. They have believed in the word of God and they have saw it as the only way by which they can be saved. You see, do we trust God because you might get something out of it, or do you trust God because he's God and nothing else? That's the question. That's the premise we want to build off of tonight. Do we trust God because of something we can get out of it, or do we trust God because he's God and that's enough? So in Acts chapter three, verse one, it says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, uh, uh, sorry, at the temple, uh, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So right away we have our, our two kind of key players that are announced in the beginning of this chapter. You have Peter and you have John. John in this, in this section is largely a silent player. He's there, but he's not really engaged. Peter is our primary actor here. No, I shouldn't say actor. He's our primary character who is going to do the talking and even the performing of uh, a miracle. I want to do. I, I do want to read what Warren Wiersbe notes on, on on this particular subject. He says the contrast between Acts chapter two and three is interesting. Peter the preacher and Peter the personal worker. Multitudes, one poor man. Ministry resulting in blessing. Ministry resulting in arrest and persecution. The events of Acts chapter three are an illustration of the last phrase of Acts chapter 2, verse 47, showing us how the Lord added to his church daily. While the Holy Spirit is not named in this chapter, he certainly was at work in and through the apostles performing his ministry of glorifying Christ. John chapter 16, verse 14. I just want to take a minute here as well to, to look at, as we look at this, there is a... There, I still firmly believe that the most effective way that we can share our faith and minister the gospel is through personal relationship, getting to know people, sharing life together with them. It's the best and, and powerful, most powerful way to evangelize. Why? Because it allows us to break down barriers. People open up. People are willing to just uh, be honest and open sometimes when they know us and they can trust us rather than if we just go and throw a track at them or shotgun the, the gospel at them because uh, I'm not saying tracks are bad. I, if you, that is an opportunity, you have absolutely take it. But how much more effective is that track when you can follow up with the person whom you've given it to? So as we read this, it says they were going to the temple about the ninth hour. And I, and I thought to myself, why do you think that the apostles were going to the temple to pray? We're, we're the church. We're not, we're not, part of Judaism anymore. We're not, we're not following the law anymore. So, so why were they going to the temple? Because I think it's important to note that, again, these first 10 chapters of the book of Acts are transitional. They, they show the transition from the church in Jerusalem to the, to the Gentile church. And, and what's interesting here is that these Jews that got saved were still following a lot of the traditions. And one of those traditions was to go to the temple and pray. And they would go three times a day. If you look at even Daniel, what would Daniel do as he was in captivity in Babylon? He would go three times a day. That's the precursor for the story of Daniel being thrown into the den of lions, right? Is that he would not stop praying three times a day. And they would pray nine, 12, and three. Okay, so every day at 9, 12, and 3, the, the, the people of Jerusalem would pray. It was part of their culture. It was part of their heritage. It was part of their even belief system. And so as Peter and John are going to the temple to pray, we get to chapter uh, 3, verse 2, and it says, And a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, they, he asked 
to receive alms. You see, the apostles were heading into the temple through one of the gates, which was named the Beautiful Gate. Um, it was probably quite a large entrance into the temple as, as people would come three times a day to pray. But it was also a lucrative place for this crippled man to position himself to collect money from people who were going in. So what we know about this crippled man, this beggar who is here, is, is he's, he's been lame from birth. He's been crippled from birth. Okay, this is not something that happened to him by accident. It was not something that happened as a result of a sickness. This is something he was born with. And as a result, he begged every day. Okay, he went and he sat there and he collected money uh, to, to live. And, and you kind of half wonder, maybe this was also an exploitation of this man by some other people. You don't know the culture is, um, but... We, we know that there was other people involved in this because people carried him there every single day, placed him at the, the gate called Beautiful, where he would ask for alms. Okay, now, when I, uh, when I think of that word alms, I, my mind automatically goes back to the old animated Robin Hood movie by Disney. Uh, you know, Robin Hood, he's trying to sneak in, so he dresses up like a blind uh, beggar, and he's going around, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. You know, that's that's what I just remind, it reminds me of. But in actuality, giving alms to the poor was actually uh, a huge part of the Jewish culture. It was part of the what they felt as an obligation to take care of the poor and the needy. So they, they were, no, I'm not saying everybody did it with a good heart. I'm not saying everybody did it at all, but, but it, was, it was still a part of the culture to take care of those needy people, those poor and down and out, uh, especially if they were there asking for your help. And so he sees Peter and John as they're walking to the temple and he stops and he says, there's some people who might be able to help me out. And so he asks them for a donation. And this is really where we begin to see the power of miracles here. But I want to ask a question. You guys, if you guys are writing down, taking notes, you guys can write this down. What is the purpose of miracles? Why are they there? Why does God do them? And I think it's important to note, especially in these early chapters um, coming out of the, the Gospels into the book of Acts, that I, I believe and what I, what I understand from my studies is that, that the miracles, especially in this early church period, they validated the message of Christ. So when Christ would go from place to place and perform miracles, it was a validating of who he was as Christ and Messiah, but also a, valid, a validating of his message that the people needed to repent and turn to God and trust in him. That message that he proclaimed in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Miracles show power and authority. They show that God is capable of doing anything, but they also show that the message that is being proclaimed, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is true and valid. The purpose of miracles is not a gong show. It's not just a spectacle. It's not entertainment. As some have made it into in our culture today. But that's not what it's about. It is about validating the message of the gospel and the authority of the apostles. Now, again, I believe that the, the sign gifts have, uh, have transitioned out uh, as we now have the canonized scripture. But it, but we, it doesn't mean we, we just go, oh, well, I'm going to skip this passage then. Because there's power here that we need to see and understand in the word of God that can stir our hearts, that can strengthen our faith as we desire to walk with God. So in, in, in chapter 3, verses 4 and through 6, it says, And Peter directed his gaze. So this this poor blind or, or crippled beggar says to can, can I get some help? Can I get some money from you? And, and Peter directed his gaze at, at him, as did John. So you could just picture them turning and looking at this man who's down there. And it was actually, it was quite sad uh, as I'm recounting this because uh, I was in Thunder Bay a couple weeks ago and it was, it was this, this man came up to me and he, he asked for money. And I said, hey, you know what, like, I, I, I don't want to give you money, but, but I, have some, I have some food here. I have some granola bars. Here, just take a box of granola bars, man, if that can help you out or, 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 or whatever. And he, no, no, I don't want your, your food. And, and, and that's okay. That's okay. I, I understand. And, and, 
But that same man I saw walking up to a lady. I know I know people are scared and, and it's a little bit different time, but he just he wasn't even close to this lady. And he says, can I, can I get some money from you? And this lady yelled at him, get away from me. And, and I just remember thinking like, wow, how sad is that? Not all of us are in a place where, 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 where we're, we don't need somebody else's help. I know I've been in places where I needed help from people. And so maybe, maybe we need to consider that as, as this man uh, asked for help. I know in my city and in Thunder Bay and you know, when you walk around there, there's places where you go and then people come up to you all the time. Is it uncomfortable? Sure it is. Is it easy just to walk away or walk past? Absolutely. And I'm not saying you have to go in, give the guy a 20 or whatever, but if, I mean, if you have food, that's what we're commanded to do, feed the hungry, right? We, we like to always carry a couple extra snacks in our cooler when we, when we are making our rounds in Thunder Bay so we can, we can give food to people so that we can say, hey, look, I'm not gonna give you money but because uh, I, I don't want you to buy drugs or alcohol with it, but I, I, I have some food, I have some fruit and, and some, some extra bars and snacks here that, that you can have. And so many times, so many people are just grateful to have something to eat. And it would have been easy for Peter and John just to walk by, but this man asked for help and they turned and they direct their gaze at him. They looked at him and, and then they said to him, look at us. And rather than focusing on all the people that were walking by, they, they look at this man and they, they, come, they, they basically tell him, you pay attention to us right now. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. He was expecting them to, to reach into their pockets, grab a few coins and, 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 and put them in the, the, the little pot or whatever he had to collect his money in. But Peter said to him, silver, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now what's interesting is, is Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold have I not. Now we know that that's probably true because everybody, uh, these 3000 plus people and numbers being added to daily, uh, we're, we're eating up a lot of resources and people were selling and giving stuff and they were they were giving to everybody as they had need. So the reality was Peter probably didn't have uh, two cents to his name. And so he goes, he says, look, I have something to give to you though. I do have something for you, but it's not money. It's not silver. It's not gold. And I think this, this provides to us a, a, a good contrast of what is sometimes truly more important. Sometimes what is, is most important is not what we have or what we can get, but the life-saving message of Jesus Christ that we can give freely to anybody. It was a free gift for us and now we can give it freely. We can proclaim it to everybody. And Peter says, look, I, I can't, I don't have money to give to you, but I do have something that you need. You need Jesus Christ. And so many times we put our, our emphasis and our importance on money, things, status, you see, but God doesn't look at what you have, how far you've climbed up the ladder, how much money you have or don't have. He looks at your heart. You see, the message of the gospel in Acts chapter 2 cut to their heart. God looks at inwardly and, and he looks beyond the physical needs or wants. He looks beyond uh, what is right in front of us. And he says, look, your, your greatest problem is not that you're, you're, you're poor or you're destitute. Your greatest problem is that you have a sin problem that is separating you from God. Your greatest problem is that you need Jesus. And so I don't have money or silver or gold to give to you, but what I do have is Jesus and I'm gonna give him to you. I have something better. Warren Wiersbe notes, he says, the giving of alms was an important part of Jewish faith. So beggars found it profitable to be near the temple. Since the believers had pooled their resources, and the two apostles had no money to give, but money was not what the man needed most. He needed salvation for his soul and healing for his body, and money could provide neither. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy your way into a miracle. But if you read Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, we're not going to for time, but, but it's even these miracles that we're about to see are a validation of what was prophesied about who Christ was. 
And so Peter says to him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I just want to point out here, it is not by Peter's name that he claims authority. It is not by his ministry that he claims authority. It is only by the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ is not a surname. It is a title. It is a messianic title. It is a title that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the prophesied one, the holy one, the one who died for our sins, who was from Nazareth yet. But he says, in his name, rise up and walk. And I believe in that moment that that man made a choice to believe in Jesus, to trust in the name of Jesus. And Peter says, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. You see, what I love about this miracle that is performed here today is it is not Peter's doing. It is not John's doing. It is the Spirit of God working supernaturally through Peter and John to perform something that would otherwise be impossible. Peter had no ability in and of himself to heal a person. John had no ability in and of himself to heal a person. Only God has that power. Only God has that ability. And that's why he says in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not me, not my power, not my abilities, not my talents, but God. And I'm reminded of this as, as I read this and as I study this, that that when we get up and we wake up in the morning and we go about our day, whether it's with our family, with ministry, with, with, uh, with our jobs, do you realize that any good that is going to come from your life, any good that is going to, to, to come as a result of your ministry, the only good that is ever going to come is not going to come by your talents, your abilities, and your goodness. It's only going to come by the power of God working through you. That's it. Only by the power of God working through you is God going to work. Now, we need to understand that means God needs us to have willing and submissive hearts to him. We have to be able to look at the word of God and say, I'm going to walk in obedience. We have to look at the, the, the leading of God and say, I'm going to walk in obedience. We have to look at what he's bringing into our lives and allowing in our lives and say, God, that is part of the perfect will of God for me right here, right now. And I just want to say, when God works, is, is there not like this, this awesome response that takes place? You look at this blind man in seven and eight uh, of this chapter, verses seven and eight. It says, and he took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. You see, Peter grabs him by his right hand and pulls him up. And I, I like to always note that, that there is so much more happening than just physical healing here. I don't know about you, I learned to walk when I was very little. I remember watching all of my kids learn to take their first steps and it, it's rough. There's lots of fall, there's lots of stuff, but, but eventually your brain learns. You sequence how to step one foot in front of the other and you learn uh, how to walk up and down stairs. You learn how to run. You learn how to do uh, ride a bike. You learn all these things, but they start when you're very young. Now, this man has been crippled from birth. And how powerful is the miracle that God not only restores the muscle in his legs, but also the bone density comes back and, and the ankles straighten out and the feet get strong and the man is able to stand. But also in the process of that, the, the synapses that takes place in the brain, the, 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 the things that, that store in our brain, how to walk are automatically put there for that man. He automatically knows how to walk. He knows how to jump. He knows how to praise God as he's singing and dancing in the temple. And I love the, the response to the miracle that is done here. It says, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk. You can just imagine the people watching this happen. You could just picture going, whoa, that is crazy. But he entered the temple with him. He went in to pray and it says, then walking, leaping, and praising God. This man was so overjoyed, so overjoyed with, with the work that God had done for him, his new, for his faith in Christ, for his new life with Jesus, that his response was to leap for joy and praise God. I remember when I got saved, I remember I was, I was 16, going on 17, I think at the time, and um, maybe even 17, I think I was 17 at the time. And I remember I got saved and it was just, there was this calm and this peace that I had, but also this overwhelming joy. I was excited. I was, 
I was feeling like, you know what? I gotta tell everybody about this. And I remember I, I, they would, at this Bible camp, it was a big camp, there's probably about 1,500 students there, and, and uh, they would go around to each church, and, and each church would select somebody from their youth group to pray for a meal. And I got selected the next day for, uh, for lunch, and those poor people just probably wanted to eat their food. And I got up and I told them how great Jesus was, and I told them how awesome uh, it was to know him as my Savior. And I, I got up there for 20 minutes before I even prayed and just shared about all the awesomeness of God and how he worked in my life. You see, is, is there a joy and excitement in your life because you know Jesus? Again, Warren Wiersbe writes this. He says, it's easy to see this man as an illustration of what salvation is like. He was born lame and all of us are born unable to walk so as to please God. Our father Adam had a fall and passed his lameness onto all of his descendants. The man was also poor and we as sinners are bankrupt before God, unable to pay a tremendous debt that we owe him. He was outside the temple and all sinners separated from God. No matter how near to the door they might be, the man was healed wholly by the grace of God and the healing was immediate. He gave evidence of what had, sorry, what God had done by walking and leaping and praising God and publicly identifying himself with the apostles in both, the, both in the temple and in their arrest at Acts chapter four, verse 14. Now that he could stand, there was no question where the man stood. I love that last line. Now that he could stand, there was no question where the man stood. Is that the way it is for us? Do we realize that we were, we were born sinners, separated from God outside of his presence, and now by the grace of God, we have entered into a right relationship with him by faith in Jesus Christ? Do people know where you stand? If you were to stand before people today, would they know that you're a follower of Christ? Would they know where that your convictions lie among the word of God? Would they know that you, your joy and your, your excitement come only from him? This man stood up walking, leaping, and praising God. We have been transformed. We have been healed by, by the grace and mercy of God. We have been restored to right relationship with him. We have hope and a future of glory with him. And, and, and so we should be excited about that. That shouldn't be a blah thing. I'm gonna read two verses a day and kind of go. No, we should be excited. We should wake up with breath in our lungs, ready to praise God. Because today we are saved. Today we still are covered by the blood of Christ and we always will be. We have redemption, we have forgiveness, we have the grace of God at our fingertips. As, as Paul says in Romans chapter five, by faith we have access into the grace where and we stand and we rejoice. We have access to the grace in which we stand and rejoice. We rejoice in the goodness and grace of God. That's why we need to remember him Always, all the time when we gather together as believers, remember what he's done for us. Remember what he's done for us. Because he's done something that is impossible for you to do. He's performed a miracle in your life. If you know him as savior, you have, you have seen the impossible done in you. Because what we deserve is condemnation. You know, all the people, if you look at verses 9 and 10, they responded to this in the same way. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You see, the response that people have to miracles is wonder and amazement. And I wonder, would people stand in wonder and amazement as they looked at our lives? Because of the fact that we wake up every morning reveling in the miracle of God in the salvation of our souls. The transformed life. So the question becomes, as we wrap this up this evening, do you stand in awe of the work that God has done in your life? Do you wake up in the morning and every day just stand flabbergasted I don't even know if that's even a current word we're supposed to be using, but do you just stand amazed, astounded, taken aback by the fact that God saved you through faith in Christ? Not by your works, not by the good things that you think you could do, not because you went to church for 20 years, 
but because you looked to the cross of Jesus Christ as the only way by which you could be saved. And God reconciled you and restored you and bought you back by his blood. Do we stand in awe of that? Because if we don't stand in awe of the miracle that God has done in our hearts, in our lives, then guess what? People are not going to look at us and stand in awe of the power of God at work in us. You see, we have to, we have to be transformed as this man was. By that same grace and that same mercy that sent Jesus Christ to the cross that now works in our lives daily. We need to be in awe and wonder of that. Because you know what? If we can't stand in awe and wonder of what God has done for us every day, that by the grace of God we're allowed to breathe again today, but by the grace of God, even though he knows we're going to sin, he still loves us and cares for us, that he still sanctifies us, that he still works in and through us, that we can still be transformed. If we don't stand in awe, if we're not amazed by that, then the truth and fact of the matter is nobody else that is around you will ever be amazed by it either. So let's do this. Let's open our Bibles every day this week. Pick a book in the New Testament. I'm, I'm going to challenge you to pick a book in the New Testament. Ephesians, Colossians, whatever book it is. And before you start reading for the day, take some time, praise God. Praise God for something he's done in your life. Praise God for an answered prayer. Praise God for what he's doing ministry-wise through you. And then approach the word of God and realize how amazing it is that God can take and transform a sinner deserving of condemnation into a person who is glorifying and honoring to him. And can we also do this? Can we get excited about what it is that God is doing? Can we get pumped up, standing in awe and amazement every day of, of the things that God has done? I'm thinking of a, a peanut butter commercial I, I saw. And you guys are saying, what's a peanut butter commercial have to do with anything? But the, the premise of the peanut butter commercial is every time you have it, it's like having it for the first time. And so in the commercial, the guy takes a bite of peanut butter bread and he goes, oh, so good. And throughout the whole commercial, every, like he's, he's like almost breaking stuff or breaking stuff. And every time he just, it's like, oh. That is so good, so good. Is that the way we approach Christ? Oh, God, your mercies are new every day. God, your grace is so satisfying to stand in. Oh, God, I rejoice in the goodness that you've shown me today. Do we wake up, breathe in Christ, and our response is, Ah, oh, that is so good, so good. God, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you so much for sending Jesus, who is so good. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for watching uh, and, and staying with us this whole time. And we, we encourage you uh, to visit us at www.nipiganbaptist.com. Uh, there's all sorts of good resources there. There's uh, sermons, Sunday sermons, other Wednesday night Bible study. You guys can click the links for a live Bible study. Um, get caught up in the book of Acts. Um, There's it, lots of good stuff there for you. We encourage you also uh, that if you have any comments or, or anything you'd like to, to share, please drop that in the comment section below. Like and share this around with as many people as you can uh, as we want people to be encouraged from the word of God as much as possible here at Nipigon Baptist. So thanks for tuning in. We hope you guys have a great week and we are praying for you and look forward to seeing you guys on Sunday digitally, not in person. Anyways, have a great week, guys. We'll see you later.